he uh, he is a local. He he's comes. He's uh, one of our friends from up uh, slightly up north in uh, uh, New Hampshire. I'm sorry, in Maine, actually, a little Maine, further up. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, uh, we've we've run into each other uh, at a number of events over the years, so it's good to have him uh, come and uh, speak to Boston Azure. His uh, background, uh, in brief, is uh, he's a senior software developer in Portland, Maine, where he builds solutions on .NET and Azure. He's, uh, these are his words. Uh, he's been writing bugs for over 15 years, uh, as we all have probably, uh, mostly in the financial service, uh, financial industry, despite or because he's still not knowing the difference between a debit and a credit. I don't think it's important to know the difference between those two, probably. I don't even. Uh, in his free time, <laughs> in his free time, he likes to make the most out of uh, both weeks of Maine's summer. So he's he's really into it. He takes care. Of, he takes real deep advantage of both uh, summer weeks, and he's uh, he likes fishing and kayaking. Uh, you can find him on the Twitters at contrived ex, and um, contrivedexample.com is his uh, blog. And this information is on the meetup page where you can find it. Uh, as I mentioned, this we unless Bob um, prefers we don't, we will uh, post this to the YouTubes. And um, with that, let, join me in welcoming Bob. Great to have you here, Bob. Over to you. All right. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, YouTube is fine. If you want to post that up, that's perfectly fine with me. Um, I also think I get to consider myself an international speaker now that we have someone from Vancouver and Serbia in the meeting, right? I mean, that sounds OK. That's totally uh, correct. All right. Been looking for that designation for a while, so got it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'm going to be talking about automating Azure. Uh, I'm going to be talking about PowerShell, Azure CLI, ARM templates, and the new BICEP language for, for creating ARM templates. Now, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a scripting expert. I'm not a super expert on any of these particular topics. I'm just a developer that didn't want to be doing tedious things all the time. And so this talk is kind of more like, um, even if you're not scripting all day long, you can still make your life easier in Azure um, just by learning a few things. We're not going to go real deep into a bunch of commands. There's an ungodly number of commands. There's, there's no way I could do it justice um, even in a week. Um, but we're going to learn um, a couple of commands and we're going to learn how to do some queries and pull data out of them and um, maybe a few tricks and tips and things that aren't quite as obvious. So hopefully you learn something. Um, a couple of people already mentioned that you know they have some PowerShell experience, some Azure automation experience. Feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. And if anybody has questions, jump in at any time. Um, we're going to kind of do this in blocks. You know, PowerShell, take a break. CLI, take a break. ARM, take a break for questions. All right, let's start the slides. So if you want to take a screenshot or write this URL down, um, all of my resources are on the URL list.com. Just a, a caveat, if you do actually type this out, Make sure you spell it correctly. That's one L in the URL list. If you type two L's, let's just say I hope you have um, good malware blocker. All right, so everything in Azure is automatable. So if you're familiar with clicking around in the portal, all of that stuff can be done in the Azure CLI or PowerShell or ARM templates. Again, we're going to look at all these three things. We're not going to talk about any REST or SDKs, um, you know, writing code with C Sharp or Java or whatever. We're just going to strictly talk about command line stuff. And my GitHub repo is at the bottom there, too. All of this stuff is on the GitHub repo if you want to take a look at it. All right, so this is a quote right off of that link that's on the screen. Command line interfaces environment to create and manage Azure resources. 
Um, it's available across all services designed to get you working quickly with an emphasis on automation. Okay, and that's what's that's what this talk is really all about is automation. It's cross platform. It works in bash shell, PowerShell, terminal, cloud shell, which I'm going to um, show you. It supports long running operations. Configurable, so let's say you're running a bunch of commands, you, you may not want to put, you know, what subscription you're using or what resource group you're using in every single command. You can you can set that as a configuration setting and it'll just automatically use that. Interactive mode, so assuming I don't forget, I'm going to show you CLI interactive, which is a pretty cool feature and I think one that um, is off of people's radar quite often. I'm not going to go over installation other than to say it's very easy. You know, it's just standard installation, MSI on Windows, etc. If you're familiar with installing software, you know, there's nothing new here. And now let's do the demo. All right, so if any of my fonts are too small or anything, let me know and I'll boost things up, but I think I've uh, bumped it up to where it should be pretty good. So what I've got here is a demo PS1 file. Now I just said Azure CLI and here I have a PowerShell script. Well, you can run Azure CLI commands in a PowerShell file and that makes it convenient for setting variables and using them in subsequent commands. So that's why it's a PowerShell script but these are Azure CLI commands and you can recognize Azure CLI because they all start with AZ. OK, so that's kind of where the title of the talk came in, the land of as. So in Azure CLI, it's AZ something in PowerShell. All the new PowerShell commandlets start with AZ as well. So the first thing you want to do when you're using the CLI is log in and I've already done this, um, but what you're going to want to do is use the AZ login command, and you can pass it a tenant, and that's your Azure tenant. And if you have more than one subscription, I, I suggest you also run this command, Azure AZ account set, and set your subscription, because if, if you don't, you're going to be connected to your default subscription, and that might not be what you want. You might be creating things in a subscription that um, is going to cost you money that you weren't expecting it to, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, you don't need to do this, but it's probably a good idea. And I'm pulling these values out of system environment variables just so I don't have to check in my tenant and subscription IDs into GitHub. All right, so all of these commands are pretty simple. Like I said, we're not going to go deep into all kinds of different um, commands. Uh, we're just going to basically see how to use the Azure CLI. And so one of the easiest commands right here, AZ group list. So what this is going to do, it's going to list all of the resource groups in the subscription that I am connected to. And in Visual Studio Code, you can highlight a section and you can hit F8 or you can press this button up here and it'll run just what you have selected. So it's a convenient way to run part of a file. And so here's the output, OK? There's a whole bunch of resource groups in the subscription that I'm connected to. Notice that it's JSON output, OK? So that's one of the first differences between this and PowerShell that we're going to see. All of that output is all JSON. If you want to work with it, you're going to have to query that JSON and pull data out. All right, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to create some resource groups, um, and then I'm going to set some properties on them, and then we're going to write some queries. So all I'm doing here, I need some random resource group names because they have to be unique in the um, in the Azure tenant, so 
I'm using um, some actually some .NET here, system.io.path. I get random file name, and that's just that's just so I get a random name. It's you know I don't care what it is for the demo, so I'm doing that three times. So in the first one here, I'm creating a group where the location is the central US. And I'm doing a query ID. So that's one of the first ways to pluck data out of Azure CLI. OK, so you write a query. You say I want to get the ID and that's dumped into this PowerShell variable ID. OK, now I'm on that same resource group because I'm using that variable, I'm going to set some tags. So if you're not familiar, all resources, as far as I know, um, all resources in Azure are taggable. So you can add um, like name value pairs for whatever reason you might want. So I'm going to add some tags to the resource groups. Um, notice this third one down here, I'm creating it in the East US and I'm creating different tags on every one of them. Okay, so if I run this set of commands, okay, that didn't take too long. All right, so notice the JSON output here. Um, I got a random file name as expected. I got my tags, Alice test and true, and the location is central US. I'm just going to run these two together, save a little bit of time. Okay, there's one of them. And there's the other one. So hopefully over in the Azure portal, we should be able to see this. So if I go to look at resource groups. So here we've got, looks like I still have some from other demos, but you can see we've got a bunch of random named resource groups in here. So just like that, I mean, just creating resource groups is super simple. But now we want to query them. So Let's say we wanted to get resource groups that are located in central US. So I'm using the query switch here. And what this is is a James path expression. OK, so if you're not familiar. You can go to. You can do a search for James path. So James path is a. Uh, a method to query JSON. And it's not a Microsoft thing, it's not an Azure thing, it's just something that the CLI supports. And so you can go here and you can do a tutorial. You know, you can run um, all these queries and stuff right here in the browser. It's a really good resource for learning James Path. It can be quite complicated, um, depending on, you know, your object graph and depending on what you need out of it. Um, it can be really complicated, so to be, get good at it, um, you really need to practice, but we're only doing some fairly simple things here. So what we're doing is a recurring location equals central US. So we should get two resource groups back for this. OK, well, we got more because again, I didn't clean up my resources, but notice all of them are in the central US. OK, so that's probably one of the simplest James path queries. Next one is we want to get central US resource groups that have tags. OK, so here we're getting just the tags. OK, before we were getting a whole bunch of information about the resource group. And now we're getting an array. Of objects that are just the tags from the resource groups. So that's the dot tags notation. And you can further pipe that out. So here we go looking for resource groups in central US that have tags where the purpose is QA. OK, and there we go. There's only two in there right now.
OK, and we can keep going. We can, you know, take that same output. We can do dot owner. OK, now we have an array of just the owners. And this is getting to something interesting, um, I promise. So notice that that output was an array. OK, so we have the brackets here. We can get index zero out of that array. OK, they're both Wally, so that's a little bit underwhelming. But notice that it has quotes around it, so that value actually has those double quotes. And I'm pointing this out on purpose because this can throw errors into your scripts. It's not necessarily what you want. And so the recommended way to get just the string out is after you do your query, you can do an output to a table separated value or tab separated value. So output is another switch you can add. By default, it's JSON. So you don't have to do output JSON. It's just there by default. But you can output to a table and you can output to tab separated values. And if you do it this way, you're just going to get the value without the quotes. OK, and if you're using this in subsequent queries, this is probably what you're going to want to do. All right, so that's a real quick introduction to James Path. Again, you can research it. Um, there's all kinds of um, neat little things in there. So, but like I said, it can get really complicated. So maybe you don't want to learn James Path and write these big long strings. You know, again, like not only is this starting to get complicated, but it's just a string. Right, so you have to get the syntax right and, you know, probably trial and error. But you can use some PowerShell here so you can run a CLI command. And then you can pipe that into the PowerShell convert from JSON. And so what that does is it turns your output into a PowerShell object. Much easier to work with than JSON and James path. OK, so. Let me run these two at the same time. OK, so notice that's our output. We actually got a PowerShell object. This is the default formatting for output, but it's not JSON. You know, it's a nice. It's a nice format that we can work with objects. And again, we can do the different properties of that object with dot notation. And there we go. Get a nice table. And then I'm going to clean up. So AZ group delete. And I can throw a no wait on there and then it's basically going to be asynchronous. I don't have to wait for it to finish. And if, in case you're not aware, if you delete a resource group, everything inside that resource group gets deleted. It's a really great way to just throw everything away. You know, if, if you're conscientious about putting things in proper resource groups for demos or, or temporary things, um, you can delete them all in one swoop. So I'm going to run that. The reset color. Um, now I'm not getting color here. I don't know what's going on exactly, but um, you can you can mess up your console color and you can get output that you're not able to see because it's like black text on black background. And so um, reset color is a good thing to do. All right, don't forget AZ Interactive. So I think this is the first time I haven't forgotten to do it right now. And maybe that's because I gave myself a note. But what the AZ Interactive is, actually, let me start it over here. Um, this is the Windows Terminal. OK, and AZ Interactive helps you write your queries. So if I do AZ Interactive, it's going to spin up this tool. 
And this tool is something you have to install separately. This does not come with the CLI installation, um, but it drops you into this. It's a terminal window, but it's a, um, it's a very smart terminal window. So let's say I wanted to list some groups. Easy, notice it's already um, showing me some commands I've done before. AZ group, okay, and space. And then it's telling me what, what I can do with the groups. I can list them, I can create them. Um, so let's choose list. And there it's listing my groups. I can do um, AZ key vault secret. name, okay, and then when I type name, so not only does it know the switches and the commands, it actually interrogates my subscription, and it says, oh, you have two key vaults, so I'm going to show you what two key vaults you have, and you can pick which one you want to use. And so, again, AZ Interactive, separate install, super, super awesome for um, learning CLI or just writing commands that you're, you know, not terribly used to running. Um, I really like this and uh, glad I didn't forget this time. Okay, that's the end of the CLI portion. Does anyone have any questions before we move on to PowerShell? I have one quick question. Yep. Hi, my name is Will Ryan. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I have one quick question. It sure. seems to me that um, CLI, I'm just wondering off the top of my head, I've mostly interacted with getting data out of Azure by calling the Azure REST APIs, okay. which return data in a similar JSON format. And I'm just wondering if the CLI, if you know, if it's underneath the covers calling the REST APIs. Uh, I, I actually don't know. I, I actually have no idea, but I've got to imagine at some level there's some convergence, you know, between PowerShell. Right. I'm, imagine, I'm, I'm imagining there's more than because because I know that the PowerShell commandlets, I believe, call the REST APIs. Um, and I do similar things where I iterate through the resource groups. I iterate through the re the different types of resources in the resource groups. Then I can ask each resource, what metrics do you expose? So, but um, this is a really great demo. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I can add slight, slight color is uh, this bill. I, I do believe that everything that's outside of Azure uh, resolves to the same REST API. So there's a a uh, uh, .NET, you know, C Sharp SDK. There's a uh, there's a Python, uh, you know, there are Python libraries and JavaScript and all across, you know, the whole development spectrum. Go, there are, there are libraries. Those all are implemented in terms of the uh, of the REST APIs. They just make them more convenient. And that's also my understanding that PowerShell and CLI are no different. And to a big degree. Uh, the portal is the same. So when you use the Azure portal interactively, it's also resolving to the same REST APIs, although they may have some additional APIs. They almost certainly have some additional APIs that we don't have access to. But um, yeah, REST APIs are uh, at the bottom of uh, almost everything you do in Azure. That makes sense. Thank you. And, you, yeah. and I, I have had to access those things. Like, for example, if you want to, I don't know, maybe they fixed it by now, but if you want to set quotas on application insights, you have to call raw REST endpoints, which you can find them calling in the portal. And then you can just go, oh, I'm going to do that too. But you can also use what's called the um, the Azure Resource Explorer, and it shows you that, that structure that you would be able to send with those requests. In the documentation for the as CLI, there is an as space REST section, and that lets you just do like a raw request. And in some of my automation scripts, I have to do that to take care of things that aren't built into the commands themselves. So I'd imagine the whole thing is REST all the way down for REST API. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, everything on top of REST is a convenience. Yep. Yeah. Both of them use the REST API, but in a little bit different way. So when you use the Azure CLI, uh, some of the command, uh, commands for creating resources 
are actually idempotent, and in Azure PowerShell, they are not. So implementation under the hood is not exactly the same, but they talk to the same APIs. That's good to know. All right, anything else? So I just I have a real quick question. Um, sure. I believe in the in in the PowerShell you can use Azure RM and AZ commands. Can you use the Azure RM commands in CLI? Yes, you can. Okay. But you can't use the RM commands and the AZ commands. You can't have them both installed at the same time. Yeah. Yep. But okay. I understand there's like a shim that you can install so that you can still use your old scripts. Yep. Yeah, but the CLI is a whole separate install from the PowerShell commandlets. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for the input, everyone. That was great. Um, I love that, you know, I'm learning and everyone's learning. So, all right. So, PowerShell, um, just like the CLI, I'm starting off with the Microsoft definition here. It's pretty much the same thing, the same use case as the CLI. Um, they try to make it easy to learn. You know, it keeps standard um, standard commands. Um, it's available on PowerShell 5.1, 6, and higher. Again, it's also cross-platform, works in all the terminals. Discoverable, so get command, get help. Those are commands that are really great for figuring out what commands are even available and how to use them. The APIs are consistent as far as, you know, with the, the verb and the nouns. Um, interactive environments are available. So, you know, plugins for VS Code or PowerShell ISE, you know, they can give you the IntelliSense and, you know, command help. As we've already seen, it's object oriented, not text output. So it can be a lot easier to work with, you know, the data coming out as opposed to, you know, JSON data. Uh, again, not going to spend a lot of time on installation. That's easy enough to look up, but you can use MSI or you can use PowerShell to install the PowerShell commandlets. That's the command right there. Connecting to Azure, so again, we connected with the CLI and there was a little caveat about maybe choosing the subscription you're connecting to as opposed to letting it just automatically connect to your default subscription. Same thing goes here, um, but it's a different connection. You use connect AZ account, you don't use AZ login. And that's the end of my slides. We're gonna go to the demo. And this demo is basically recreating everything I did in the CLI, um, except I'm doing it in PowerShell. So I'm going to go a little bit faster because we already know what it's doing. I'm just going to highlight the differences. But again, here's here's how to log in, um, connect AZ account, and you know pass that tenant as subscription to make sure you are where you think you are. All right, so again, we're going to start out by listing resource groups. So get AZ resource group. And so we should see all the same resource groups we saw before. But again, it's not coming in as JSON. It's PowerShell objects. OK, we're going to create three random resource groups again. I'm doing this one a little bit differently than the other two. So I'm still using get random file name. Um, I'm using new AZ resource group as the command. And then for this one, I'm doing a set AZ resource group command on this resource group to set the tags. Okay, so it's two separate commands to create the resource group and to set the tags on it. But in these two, I'm doing it all in one step. I'm adding the tags right at the same time. So just to show you a little bit of variation there. 
So I'm just going to run all of these at once. And there we go. So we see the random file, the, the random names. You see the tags again, it's nicely formatted, formatted in tables. Now we're going to start querying just like we did with the CLI, but we're going to do it PowerShell way. So what we're going to do is use our get Azure resource group that we've been using and pipe it to the where object where location equals central US. Okay. So that came back pretty fast. Those are all central US. Um, we're going to pipe that again to where you know tags are not null. So if you recall with the CLI, all I had to do was ask it for tags, and it only returned me the ones that had tags. But now I have to actually say where the tags are not equal to null. And there we go. I'm glad that's nice and speedy. It's not always the case on demos. Um, OK, so we're going to carry this a little bit further. So we're going to look for tags where the purpose equals test. And apparently I don't have any. Whoops. But I think you get the idea. But notice how this is it. At least to me, this makes more sense than writing James path queries, you know, which can get complicated. They're strings. They're just they're just harder to work with, in my opinion. And this is almost um, a little bit link like if you're familiar with C sharp link, you know, this this is kind of intuitive. All right, so again, I'm going to clean up and reset. My uh, console color there. And that's just going to delete all of those random resource groups. All right, so that was a lot faster. We just did the same things as the CLI. Um, just, just showing you a few of the ways you can query. Um, are there any questions about these PowerShell commands? All right. Uh, so I've got a question about those. Are those expected to stick around long? Because it seems like the new as CLI is on a path to replace everything. Um, I don't have any insight into that, but I do think they will stick around for a long time. Um, I, I don't think they're going anywhere. They're CLI and PowerShell, to me, they have very much overlapping use cases, but also slightly different use cases. I know that, um, you know, Bill talked about the AZ204 exam group in the Slack channel. Um, I took that exam at the end of July, and it was full of PowerShell. Um, I don't want to violate the NDA or anything, but there was there was really a lot of PowerShell to the point where they're like, you know, which command do you want to use here? And, you know, it's like a, this long command with, you know, Docker container this and it's like, so they're making, a, they're still making investments. I, I do not think the PowerShell commands are going anywhere. And I think they will continue to make a lot of investment there. Do you have any insight into that, Bill? So uh, Alexander here, I can jump in because I just had a, a chat with uh, PM for Azure PowerShell and uh, Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI will be with us for a long, long time. Yeah. The reason why we have them both is that uh, at the time when Azure PowerShell started, it was only for Windows because the PowerShell at that time worked only on Windows. And they needed something for Linux and Mac so they introduced Azure CLI for it. So now we have two. And they are developed in parallel, mostly overlapping, 
but the service coverage is not consistent. So there are certain services that work only in Azure PowerShell or in Azure CLI. And the promise is that at certain point, both of those CLI tools will practically cover everything in a pretty much the same way. That's kind of a goal so that you can choose instead of being forced to use one or another. Great. Wow, we have a great resource there. So thank you for that. All right, if there's nothing else, I'm going to move on and talk about Cloud Shell. OK, so Cloud Shell, if let me bring my terminal back up. So I was doing things in the terminal here. You can do things in a PowerShell terminal. You can do things in a regular command prompt terminal. You can also do things in the Azure Cloud Shell. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to see what my slides say here. So I got a couple screenshots. Supports PowerShell. Supports Bash. So you know you can choose if you want to use Bash or PowerShell in the Cloud Shell. It has some built in help. I'm going to show you that. You know, font settings. File management, you can upload and download files. Um, and I'm going to um, demonstrate running a file that I've uploaded. Web preview. Um, I, I put this in here because I thought it was interesting, but I haven't had time to really dig into it. Um, yeah, it appears to let you generate a website right here in PowerShell in the storage that's backing it. Um, I'm not sure what use that's for yet, but it looks interesting and I encourage you to, you know, research that in case um, in case it's something I'm really missing. There's an editor. So I believe this is the Monaco editor or what started out as Monaco editor. Um, I'm not sure, but I think it has VS Code bits in there. So you have a fairly good editor right inside the cloud shell. Now let's demo it. So again, in in the Microsoft terminal, you have the option to do Cloud Shell. So you could do it right there. In the Azure portal, if you've never noticed this little icon, you've got Cloud Shell right here. And you can start that up. If you've never run it, it's going to set up a storage account for you behind the scenes to, to store things. And this gives you a PowerShell or a Bash shell that you can run your Azure CLI commands in or your PowerShell commands. A real advantage to Cloud Shell is that everything's already installed. So you don't have to you know, install anything on your machine necessarily. It's, it's just already there and it's already connected to your Azure subscription. So here you get a split screen um, that may not be what you want. So something you can do is go to shell.azure.com. And I hope I don't have to do the dance here. OK, good. So it gives you a full screen um, cloud shell environment. OK, so if I were to, let's say, um, if I were to open the editor, which I talked about, I can see my file system here. Um, I can see that I've got some scripts. So here's a PowerShell script. It's obviously pretty simple, but I can run this um, get az subscription. So I should be able to run. Um, get so. And so there you go. I've got my subscription. So what I just did was this PS1 file. I've uploaded this to my Azure Cloud Shell. 
at some point in the past and it's just sitting there for me and I can, you know, do any kind of PowerShell script actually. And that's convenient if you've got something that you need to do on a regular basis, obviously. You know, it's just sitting there. You can do it from anywhere. Um, you can even do it from your phone. So here's my phone and I've got an Azure app installed. This is the official Microsoft Azure app. And if I open this up, okay, so I've got Cloud Shell right down here. So I can run this same Cloud Shell right in my phone. And if you're thinking, well, why would you ever want to do that? Um, I haven't had a great reason to yet, but the interesting thing here is if you're mobile, maybe it's three in the morning and you get a phone call, you know, something's broken, you have a script that you know fixes it, you can drop in here and you can, you know, run your get sub, you know, someone just has an emergency, they need to know all of your subscriptions, right? So there you go, you have that script already there, you can just run it right on your phone and go back to sleep. So hopefully someone has a better use case than that, but I just wanted to demo it and then I think it's pretty cool that you have that power, you know, right on your phone. You can access those files you uploaded and you can do anything you want. All right, so that's that's a quick overview of the cloud shell. Um, again, you can do it right from um, your terminal if you'd like it, to do that instead. A bunch of different ways you can run it. Any questions about Azure Cloud Shell? Is that something that you can share with other people on your team? Like so you can make like a script and they can uh, let me phrase this a different way with more context. So like I might make a bunch of scripts, but like I worry that my teammates might be too lazy to proactively get them. Yeah. Um, so like you were saying, like three in the morning, I might need someone else to run that script. Is there a way with Cloud Shell that that script can just be there and you could like tell someone on the phone, run this script that you've never run before? Like, can you Absolutely. share that space? You can, yes. You can choose what storage account you want to back this shell. And you can give anybody access to that. So um, that's one way to do it. If you just take all the defaults, it's going to create a, a brand new random storage account and tie it in. But there is a way that you can tell it the storage account you want to use. And when people log in, they're still going to log into their own session, um, but they can be connected to that common storage account and get all those files. All right, anything else before we move on? All righty. Now we're going to talk about Azure Resource Manager templates. OK, so uh, I think someone already mentioned a dislike for ARM templates, and that's not unwarranted necessarily. Um, it's very verbose. It, it can be very daunting to look at a big script. You know, this one I have on the screen is not very big, but all it does is creates the storage account and it's already, you know, going off the screen. Um, it's not the best um, experience, you'd say. And that's where Azure Bicep comes in, which I'm going to talk about at the very end. But as your resource manager template does have its advantages, okay? For one thing, it's very machine readable. It's just JSON. You know, it's it's just JSON that follows a schema. You can run these with PowerShell, CLI. You can do it in the portal. You can use Azure DevOps. Uh, I'm sure there's many more ways that you can run these. Why would you use them? It has declarative syntax. 
Okay, describes what you want, not how. So you say, I want a storage account. You know, you're, you don't call an API necessarily. You just say, I want a storage account. Repeatable results, so they're idempotent. So if you run the exact same script a second time, you're not going to get another storage account necessarily. I mean, it depends on how you craft the script, but it will it will update new things in the script and it will keep the existing things the same. Orchestration, so the correct order of operations is generally handled automatically, although you can tell it what dependencies other things have um, to make sure it does things in the right order. It can perform parallelism. So if you're creating a storage account and creating a key vault and you're setting up a managed identity, you know, these things are um, kind of mutually exclusive. They can all be done at the same time. And so, you know, it's going to parallelize those and save you some save you some time when you're running these. Built in validation, so the templates get validated before they're run. Modular, you can compose templates from other templates. You can nest templates inside other templates um, to give you some, you know, code reuse functionality. This is one of the best things. And any new Azure service or feature is immediately available in ARM templates. Okay, unlike PowerShell and the CLI, which necessarily lag behind at least a little bit, they may not lag behind long, but with ARM templates, you can do absolutely anything in Azure from the moment the feature is released. And so that may be one reason why you have to use ARM templates. Track deployments, this is another great feature. If you're running a PowerShell script or an Azure CLI script, um, you're just running the script. There's no real um, visibility into what's going on necessarily. Of course, you get you get audit logs and, and things like that in Azure. But with ARM templates, you actually get track deployments. And I'm going to show you that. Policy remediation is done. If you're not familiar with Azure policy, um, these are things that you can put constraints on resources in Azure. So let's say you don't want people creating a virtual machine that is, you know, a thousand CPUs and the most memory in the world um, because it's really expensive. You can write a policy to prevent certain SKUs from being created. You can write a policy to require tags. Um, it's a huge, huge topic, um, but policy remediation is done with ARM templates. CICD, so um, different CICD systems support this. Azure DevOps, obviously, there's a you know a, a task that you can just drop into your pipeline, and it will run the ARM template. Exportable code, so. All of your resources in Azure can be exported to an ARM template. So you can go into the Azure portal and you can go, you know, choose the correct blade, export it to a JSON file, and you've got at least a starting point for an ARM template that does um, whatever that resource is. Typically, you're not going to be able to use the template um, as is, there are going to be some hard coded things that you're going to want to parameterize, et cetera, but it's a really good starting point. Authoring support. So there are different tools like VS Code, Visual Studio that help you write that JSON. Again, it's, it's not the most intuitive thing, um, but you do get some help with the tooling. This is the anatomy of a template. Okay, so these files can get really, really huge if you're deploying like a whole environment of all kinds of stuff. But at the basic root of it, this is what a template looks like. OK, just these sections and that's it. These sections get really big, but that's them in a nutshell. And I'm going to go over each one real quick. 
So schema, schema is required. Um, you can actually use this literal value right here. This is not the most recent one. Um, if you're using a, an IDE that knows about ARM templates, like Visual Studio Code with the extension installed, it's going to say, hey, you know, there's a newer schema. Do you want to use it? And you just say yes, and it'll write it for you. Content version. So this is required, but it's not used by Azure for anything. It's just for your own use. You know, what version do you want to give to this template? You know, version one. You can make this whatever you want. The API profile. So different resources have different APIs, but if you want to try to use a, like a common API profile for all of the resources that you're defining in the template, you can use an API profile kind of at a global level. This is not required. Parameters, okay, so these are runtime values passed to the template. You know, if you're a developer, you are familiar with parameters. Um, the great thing about the different tooling and the, and the different things like Azure Portal, they know how to interact with parameters when it reads, and we're going to see this, when a, a template has parameters, the user interface is going to give you a place to type in values for all those parameters. So it's kind of smart that way. Variables, uh, again, somewhat like parameters, but they're not passed in. They're just uh, reusable values throughout your script, so you don't have to repeat or hard code anything that you don't want to. Functions, so I found this a little odd. You can actually write functions in JSON. Okay, so it's a little strange, right? JSON is not executable code, but you can write functions in JSON. Um, typically, you're going to use the built in functions quite a bit. Um, I don't, I honestly, I've never written my own function. I just use the built in ones and they've suited me just fine so far. The resources are the meat of the script. Okay, these are the things that you want to deploy to Azure. Okay, so the resources section is probably by far the biggest section. And you can put storage accounts in here, Azure SQL databases, Cosmos databases, um, key vaults. I mean, you can really stack it up and there, it, there is a maximum ARM template size. I can't remember what it is, but it's pretty huge. Um, so you can you can deploy entire environments with a script. Outputs let you return values. OK, so these show up in I mentioned deployments earlier. You can see a history of deployments with ARM scripts. You can see the output of your scripts in the deployment history, and you can also grab that output from a subsequent ARM template and use it as a value. A common thing to do like here on the screen is a resource ID. So if you've created a resource, you know, you don't know what the ID is until you've created it, but you need to use it in another script. This output is what you can use to um, chain those scripts together. All right, let's do a quick demo. Not that one. This one. All right. So here is an ARM template. This is one of the simplest ones that I could write. Um, it's very short. It's only deploying a single resource. But I'm going to walk through some of the things that we talked about in the slides. So again, the schema. Here's 2019 instead of 2015. Content version, again, required, but doesn't matter what it is. Here's some parameters. OK, so storage prefix is a parameter. I just named that storage prefix. I could have named it Mickey Mouse, um, but I'm defining some metadata here. So the type is a string. It has a minimum length and it has a maximum length. OK, the storage skew. OK. So the default value is um, standard locally redundant storage. 
if you don't pass a value for a parameter, it's going to use that default. OK, so that default can be really handy to save you some time. Allowed values. So here's a list of values that it will let you use. OK, so if you try to choose something not in that list, the template is not going to allow you to do that. Here's a location parameter. Um, that's a really common one. And here we see our first use of a function. OK, so this is one of the built in functions. Resource group is scoped to the resource group. That this. Is deploying into. OK, so. If you're not familiar with arm templates, this is something that um, I had to wrap my head around at the very beginning. You have to have a resource group first, OK, because this is deploying stuff into a resource group. It's not creating a resource group. So what this is doing is. In the resource group you're deploying to, you know, grab its location and set that as the default value. For the location parameter, OK? I think very often you want to put your resources in the same location as your resource group, and so that just saves you some time. So here's a variable and we're going to introduce a couple of couple more functions that are built in. OK, so I want a unique storage name. You know, storage accounts have a DNS entry. They have to be unique across all of Azure. And so this is a way to generate a unique name. And so starting on this end, we're going to get a unique string. Again, we're using the resource group function. Same one we did up here. Only this time we're using the ID. And we're using the unique string function. And what this does is it hashes the result of this. And that's the unique string. It's the hash. OK, so it's not. Um, it's not a random string. It's it's a hash and it's going to return the same thing for the same input. And we're going to concatenate the storage prefix. OK, so whatever we put in for this parameter, it's going to be that value plus the hash of the ID, and that's going to be our unique storage name. And we can use this multiple times throughout the script. If you notice, we're using it twice. All right, so that's our parameters section, and that's our variables section. So now we get to the resources section. This is an array, OK? So you can put multiple resources in here. The type are well-documented type names. So you can go to the um, Resource Explorer, which was mentioned earlier by one of the attendees, and you can see what, um, what type you need to use. This is very specific, and you may need to look it up. Um, you may have help from your IDE but this is what defines the storage accounts in Azure. I have an API version. If you need to um, use a specific API, the name is coming from a variable. OK, so the name of my storage account is dynamic. Location is coming from parameters. The SKU is coming from parameters. OK, this is hard coded as the storage V2 type of storage account. And then properties here supports HTTP traffic only so that you have to access it over TLS. Um, there are many, many more properties that you can set here. Um, I'm keeping it simple, um, setting things that I need, not bothering with things I don't need. But if you were to export a storage account, in the Azure portal, you would see many, many, many more things here than I've got. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, we've got the outputs and I'm not doing anything with the output. You know, I'm just demonstrating here that I'm going to have a storage endpoint. Object output from this script and the value is going to be. The primary endpoints of this storage account. So a storage account, you know, is a web accessible resource. It has primary endpoints, URLs. And what I'm doing here is I'm using a reference function. To get a reference to that storage account now that it's already created, 
OK, the outputs happens after the creation of the resource. And I'm grabbing the primary endpoints properties and outputting that. All right, so that's a walk through this script to deploy it. I've got a PowerShell script right here. OK, so new AZ resource group deployment. And I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to tell it what resource group I want to put it in. Again, doesn't create a resource group. It puts things in a resource group. The template file, um, the storage prefix. So this is a parameter. This is a parameter. So notice I'm stuffing some parameters right into this command right here. Storage prefix and storage skew. Those are not documented switches on this PowerShell commandlet. OK, those are my parameters. So if I run that with any luck, And there we go. Awesome. So gave me some output. OK, so told me what my parameters were and the values. And here's the outputs. OK, so here are the primary endpoints of that storage account there I created. And it looks like it was done successfully. If I jump over to the Azure portal. close my cloud shell here. We don't need that anymore. And I go to storage accounts. OK, I should see. I'm not sure which one it just created. It's the bottom one. It's what? The bottom one? Yeah. OK, thank you. All right, so here's my storage account created. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for. Um, you know, have, has anyone gotten um, presenter blindness before? I'm looking oh, yeah. for. Deployment. You could type it into the search. Deployments are on the resource. Go group. to an overview. If you go to an overview, then you have deployments. So Bob, go to the resource group and look for the deployment. It's on the resource yep. group. Not, not on a storage account. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Thanks. Deployments right here. OK. So I mentioned that. Deployments are tracked with ARM templates, unlike PowerShell and CLI. So what you can do here is you can go into your resource group deployments and you can go look at deployments that have happened. OK. And so. Here's some inputs that went into the deployment. Here are the outputs that came out of the deployment. And here's the template that was run for the deployment. OK, so you can even see the actual template you used and you can also see the parameters and variables right here. OK, so I think that's a great feature. You know, you have that traceability, you have that history. Also, you've got this. You got this thing in Azure called templates, OK? Nice and you can just run them. So if I go over here to templates, I've got one template here. So if I open that up, I can I can edit it and I can look at it. Um, this is the same thing we've already seen. OK, should be pretty much exactly what I already ran. But I have this deploy feature right here. OK, so if I upload a template, I can go in and just very quickly deploy it at any time. You just have to choose your resource group. You have to choose any settings that you do not provide a default value for. Um, that's random enough. 
Notice I've got default settings already in here. I could change it if I want to. You agree to the terms, you click purchase. OK, so most of the time what you're doing in here is going to cost you some money, so that's why it says purchase. I had some validation errors, um, so I'm not sure what that is. I may have an error in my script, but um, that's not important. The important part is that in this templates section, you can um, save a bunch of templates and just go in and boom, 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 deploy things. OK, I think that's the end of my demo for ARM templates. Anyone have any questions about that? Uh, Bob, I have one question. Sure. It, um, and that PowerShell command you did, the, the, the new AZ resource group deployment, you had yeah. a parameter file in there as an argument. Can you put in a, I mean, you have a, the, you have the Azure deploy file. Can you add a, a parameter JSON file in there also? Absolutely. Because um, like he's like he said, you, someone can enter the parameters in, and and that right. obviously it passes it to the deploy. So I just was curious. No, it doesn't come it's up. It's just called you, but... parameter file. That's that's how I used to do my deployments back when I did ARM. Like parameter file, all one word. I didn't know you could put parameters on the command line like that. So I used to do it the opposite way. So yes, you can definitely do it. So yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, and that is a good way to you know to keep your parameters um, nice and clean and transferable. That's why. Great. Thank you. The reason why I'm asking you is because I need to create resources through a bamboo pipeline and this the way to actually run the command it's a lot easier you this will be a lot easier using that powershell because it's more native than bamboo so that's really good right yeah awesome Great. thanks you're welcome all right so we're going to move on um almost done here we're not quite done with ARM templates because I want to talk about Azure Bicep. OK, so this is fairly new, still in preview. Um, so it's not production ready yet, but what Azure Bicep is, is a domain specific programming language for authoring ARM templates. So this is something that's been missing with ARM. Um, you know, like I said, ARM templates can be hard to work with. You know, a lot of people find it difficult or cumbersome. And so they developed this bicep programming language. And if you um, didn't catch it, you know, arm templates are on, you know, bicep is on your arm, right? I guess it's funny or something. Um, but it's just an easier way to author arm templates. Um, it compiles down or it transpiles down, depending on who you ask two regular ARM templates. So the output is exactly an ARM template. You will use it the exact same way you use any ARM template. It's just the way that you author it is a little bit different. And here's an example. Uh, I'm going to go through an actual example real quick in a demo. Uh, but again, it's a very early preview. Um, it's a command line interface, so there is a, um, you know, a bicep CLI. There's a Visual Studio Code plugin for it, of course, just like everything. How is life better with Bicep? So this is a paraphrasing right from this GitHub link, um, GitHub Azure Bicep. So this syntax is simpler than JSON. You can break your project out into modules, better copy and paste experience, for instance, um, you know, in an ARM template, you have all your parameters, all your variables in one section. It's very rigid. Um, there's some, some more leeway as far as variables in bicep scripts. Automatic dependency management. So based on the symbolic name of things you're using, it can figure out 
the dependencies between things. So as long as you craft it correctly, um, you can manage dependencies between resources that way. And it has richer validation and IntelliSense. So this should be a pretty quick demo. So what I've got here is a main.bicep file. It doesn't have to be called main, but the file extension is bicep. And so again, this is basically recreating the ARM template that we just looked at. Okay, we got parameters, we've got variables. Here's the way you describe a resource. Looks pretty pretty similar to the JSON, but it's you know not quite. Um, you know, things aren't all strings. You know, these are actual variables. It, you know, it is an actual programming language. And then output here is the ID of the storage account instead of the primary endpoints. But what you do here is, you know, once you write your bicep file, bicep build, and then give your file name. Okay, and over here, if you saw it real quick, main.json popped in. If I open main.json, this should look pretty much almost exactly like the ARM template that we've been using. Okay, so write it in a programming language, output an ARM template, and from there, you know, just use it however your preference is. All right, that I think ends my presentation. I already did that demo. Here's the resource link again. All right, any any overall questions? I got a bicep question. Um, so I looked at bicep a while back and and farmer as well as ways to like get around using arm templates. You know, because I'm one of those haters of ARM templates, but like when it when it comes down to it, like you got to make Azure resources, right? right. And, and even like not liking ARM templates, like I can see some good sides to them. Like for example, um, if you need to create like 10 resources and they don't depend on each other, an ARM template will create them in parallel, which is really nice, saves yeah. a lot of time. Um, doing that like with a script is like pretty difficult because you have to manage the parallelism and all that. Right. But when I looked at Bicep, it just looked like a different syntax for making ARM templates, like not a full-fledged programming language, which if it is like a full programming language, that gives it a whole new value to me, right? Because then you can start saying like, if the state of the world looks like this, or if I'm like in my dev subscription, do this special, super special thing that would be otherwise like really difficult with an ARM template in the raw. Like can this thing like make, is this like a full JavaScript environment? Can it make like requests? To other resources before it generates the ARM template and make decisions? Oh, I see. Not that I know of. Um, that's a good question. It's still very early. You know, it's, um, I don't know what preview they're in right now. I'm probably actually a couple reps behind on my machine, but I think they were looking for sometime in the spring even to have a candidate release. So, I'm not aware of, you know, libraries or APIs that do general purpose, you know, HTTP requests or, or things like that. But I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I really wouldn't be surprised if they did that. I, I just don't have an answer for you. Anything else? It costs all global manufacturing plants by 2035 to stand for lower greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> oh, we got a question from the radio, it sounds like. Uh, folks, please, please feel free to unmute and uh, pop any questions for, for any final questions for Bob here. 
Any, any uh, prediction on when ARM will be fully baked? Um, the bicep? I'm sorry, bicep will be fully baked. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't really, I, I think I, I attended a community stand up for it and I believe they said February for a release candidate. And so it's still going to be a while, maybe the summer, you know, before they actually have a, a V1 or maybe even the fall. But I don't really have a lot of insight into that. I know that there, there, there are. There may not be. Oh, sorry, sorry, please go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, there are alternatives. Um, you know, there's Terraform, there's Pulumi. Um, there's um, someone just mentioned another one. I I can't remember what it was, but um, Farmer. Farmer. There you go. Thanks. The, it's the open yes. source version of what Bicep is becoming. Okay. Okay. So there are a number of. Um, there are a number of tools for deploying to Azure and AWS and Google, um, but you know, Bicep is strictly a Microsoft creation. Um, anybody have any final questions for Bob? If not, we can um, move into uh, wrap up mode. I, I guess actually uh, just briefly uh, uh, an observation on Bicep. I noticed that the uh, that it still includes some complexity that maybe was an opportunity to shed, like the version numbers of the APIs. Do we really need that by as the you know the default for our new language? Right. That's it makes it hard to do file new bicep file. You always need to go find a old template somewhere. Right, that's a good observation. Yeah, I don't know. Well, so so with uh, with that, um, if there are no more questions, I'd like to to thank you, Bob. Uh, it was excellent, uh, really informative, and uh, great combination of the why does this matter and the practical and uh, and then uh, right before our very eyes um, some um, uh, you know insightful demo so so really appreciate that I uh, appreciate that the, the group joining from uh, across the world here uh, I noticed Mark uh, Eisenberg's here too I don't know if he was in from you stateside here or from uh, coming in from Israel 